Welcome to Professor Game Podcast, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting the students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I teach and work at IE Business School in Madrid, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Want to know more? Go to professorgame.com slash subscribe, start on our email list, and ask me anything. So Engagers, today we have another person which you probably haven't heard of before, and you should and you will now after this interview. But before we get started, Dr. Michael Rucker, are you prepared to engage? I am. Let's do this. <laughs> and is Rucker the way to pronounce it? Yep, you got it. <laughs> Fantastic, because he is a peer-reviewed author with over a decade of professional writing experience. And for many years, he has served as the health tech expert for About Inc. For about Inc.'s Very Well Health and is currently the chief digital officer of Active Wellness, which is a global health management company ranked in the top 40 by club industry. This year, he was also tapped by HIMSS as a top 10 health influencer, and he has been published in academic journals like International Journal for the Workplace, Health Management, and Nutrition Research, and he has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, CIO.com, and elsewhere. He is also a prolific writer and sought-out speaker in the science of fun, as well as an avid blogger who has interviewed over 100 thought leaders for his website, michaelrucker.com. And he can also be found, of course, in Instagram as the wonder of fun. Have we missed anything, especially in the area of fun, leisure, you know, and all these things, Michael, from your intro? Uh, no, I think uh, the only, you know, for the sake of plugging, um, I am coalescing all the science that I've gathered with regards to fun and how fun can be applied to life. Um, so I have a book coming out next year called The Fun Habit. Um, but besides that, I think you've, you've covered it well. So thank you for that. <laughs> Fantastic. Before we get into the meat, we would like to know, like, I know you're doing many things. You, we were talking in the pre-chat that you're very much into the health world, but also in, you know, doing all this research on, the, on fun and how it integrates into our lives. We would like to know how does, you know, a regular day or week, what does it look like in a general day? To, what does it feel like to be a Michael Rucker today? So that's an interesting question. I think, you know, for a lot of us that, you know, pay attention to how to quote unquote optimize our lives, you know, we all have tools from our toolbox and, you know, some uh, work well for a majority of folks and then sometimes they're outliers. So for me, um, I definitely prescribe to the idea that we should have habitual behavior. You know, I'm sure you've talked about um on your podcast before, this idea of heuristics and how they help us sort of uh, achieve more. But uh, I do tend to think in a nonlinear fashion. So the way that I've mitigated my week is that I will pre-program what needs to get done in sort of time blocks um, and then allow myself to take a modular approach to my week. So where many of my colleagues, you know, uh, it serves them well to sort of organize their day and know what that looks like and be able to answer a question like this. Um, for me, it's more organizing my week about what needs to get done so that it's not, you know, that I can't uh, measure my progress at the end of a week, but doing it um, by the day tends to be folly for me. So that's the best way that I can answer that type of question <laughs> discreetly. That sounds, um, we, we have in common near AL, <laughs> that sounds... <laughs> kind of like indistractable, but not quite. So I'm guessing yeah. that you have some differences there as well. Well, it's funny because I just got to sit down near a, a friend of mine. So um, we were just in San Francisco together at the same conference last week. And um, we were chatting, as we often do, about behavioral science. And yes, he is a firm believer in time blocking. And time blocking works for a majority of the people. Um, but I had disclosed to him, as I'll disclose to you and your audience now, that you know, because I do like this stuff and geek out on it, I have been working with a neuropsychologist here in North Carolina who did a battery of tests on the way that I process information. And I'm one of a select few that does sort of need to um, balance out in any given hour what I'm doing. And so the way I mitigate that is I certainly time block in my week um, so using a part of that strategy for things like deep work, for email, 
But what I'll do is I'll have my basket of what needs to get done within that week and then sort of shift um, and keep track of how I'm operating within that hour. And so since I have this sort of unique superpower to be able to do that, <laughs> I don't have the same transfer costs that a lot of other folks would have, you know, if they're sort of getting distracted by one thing to another. So, uh, you know, the science is clear that there for a majority of folks, you know, within that bell curve, you know, probably four or five sigmas, um, the idea of working in a draft and then going to email, well, you, there's a cognitive cost for that transfer, right? For me, yeah. as long as it's um, that space is all easily accessible, my brain naturally shifts to that area. So to keep my monkey mind focused on somewhere it doesn't <laughs> want to be actually is more cognitive taxing. Well, that one's interesting because, again, I'm giving advice for uh, for the minority, right? Because you want to be careful that you don't use that as an excuse. Yeah, and, and it also sounds like getting into flow for you is either way too easy or it's kind of inaccessible in a way. I'm not sure which which end are you on or, or maybe a bit of both. Yeah, I think that's a good way. You know, flow is interesting in the fact that it's just a construct, right? Yeah, Certainly a lot of what I've looked at, and it's a bit controversial, is that fun is an easy way to sort of short circuit into flow, right? Because in essence, you know, the basic ingredients of flow is feeling timelessness, right? And so all that means is for me, these creative bursts come in shorter intervals than they would for someone else, but I'm able to chain them together faster than somebody else because of the way my brain works. So yes, to find deep flow, for instance, you know, tennis players are often used, you know, they can play a match for three hours and it feels like five minutes. I don't think that I would engage, you know, one of my passions is writing. So I don't, I'm not going to engage in writing for three hours and look back at it, you know, with the same sort of admiration than my previous example. But I can say that I've done four things and chained together, you know, this uh, flow within that environment. Um, again, because for me, the ability to sort of stop my brain from going to the next thing is harder for, than it would be for most people. But as long as I stay on task and have four things to shift around, and they're very deliberate, right? Another thing for people that are easily distracted is that there's no purpose for the next thing to jump to. So uh, one of the mitigating strategies for someone you know, with a brain wired the way mine is, is to be deliberate about where your brain goes next. And so again, that's why, you know, what are the four buckets of things that I need to get done? Those are predetermined have those available so that when I get bored with the first thing, I'm going to something else that's equally as important, but is right there at the ready. Because again, the transfer cost isn't there for me because I'm not shifting, you know, I'm not getting the alert of an email that's, you know, pulling me away from something that I should be doing to not, you know, potentially not, that is not important, you know, channeling my inner Stephen Covey, right? Um, <laughs> there you go. There you go. So how, how I would like to know, because we've been talking about the, the Michael Rucker, the outlier. And of course, you've also made a lot of research on those who are not the outliers. And I would like to know, how does that look like maybe for not necessarily just the, the, um, the state of flow or, or getting into these, you know, deep, deep work and these things, but how does, you know, how does fun integrate to, you know, our lives or professional lives? How, how, what have you found in your research, of course, in a, in a nutshell? Yeah, I appreciate that opportunity. So like all good researchers, you know, generally you amass what's out there before you get started, right? And so one of the things that I found about three years ago, I think we mentioned it, you know, in the pre-interview, um, I had a bunch of things get in the way of my ability to sort of find delight and joy. Um, my little brother unexpectedly passed away. I was an avid triathlete and found out unexpectedly around the same time, unfortunately, that was just a bit of bad luck that I had advanced osteoarthritis that hadn't, hadn't previously been diagnosed that kind of condition kind of sneaks up on you. And so needed a hip replacement that, you know, made it since that surgery, I uh, haven't been able to run competitively again. And, but up to that point, I had been a big believer in positive psychologies. You know, I was a charter member of the IPPA and certainly, you know, disseminated a lot of information coming out of that consortium and still believe in, in much of it. But at the, that period of life, all these tools that I had at my disposal weren't making me happy. And so I, you know, as a researcher was like, there's got to be more out there, right? Generally, when someone 
that has a fancy, has a researcher, faces a problem, the first thing they do is go to PubMed or scholar.google.com, right? And so <laughs> I did that. And like a good researcher was like, wow, there's a, sh you know, all this stuff about happiness that's come out of, you know, Penn and, and other institutions that, you know, create quite a bit of research on positive psychology, but no one's really looking at any action oriented approaches, things like fun. And so what was out there was primarily stuff around childhood development and games. So I dredged up what was there and kind of started to piece it together myself and realized that if you do apply fun as an action oriented approach to, you know, pulling yourself out of despair, it tends to have a much higher efficacy than a lot of the things that we prescribe um, for people to go out and search out happiness, right? And I think intuitively, if you bring in things like system design, which you probably know really well through, you know, because that parallels well with game theory, if you take this action oriented approach and start measuring your gains, like how am I engaging more in life? How am I designing things so that I can find more and joy and delight in the things that I'm already doing, then you distance yourself from that gap of like, okay, why am I not happy? And I'm here and I want to be there, you know, which is really where despair lives, right? And you can completely circumvent that by taking this action oriented approach. And again, that's why I had brought up the idea of flow really just being a construct defined primarily by Cheek Sent Me High, right? Where <laughs> yeah, happiness absolutely. and fun are really just words too. But at the end of the day, the way we're using them, especially here in the West, fun is this idea that we can go out and do things that bring us pleasure and that we have some agency to do that, where happiness is more of a subjective construct, right? Even the way that it's being studied, you know, you need subjective instruments to be able to do that. And as such, if you optimize around happiness, you're kind of discounting a lot of evolutionary things that are part of our being, right? I think one of the biggest problems I have with this idea of optimizing for happiness other than fun is that you can't be sad. And so going back to my personal experience, you know, I had been trained to optimize for being happy. And what I found, and I, you know, I kind of stumbled on this finding is that, wait, I should be able to be sad. My brother just died, but doesn't necessarily mean I have to wallow, you know, in my bedroom or be full of despair. Like I can go out and do pleasurable things, which my brother certainly would have wanted me to do and still, you know, have this sense of sadness because right now something bad has happened. And so I think yep. that's, you know, one of the major differences. Absolutely. And and I think it's very important to be able to to distinguish and to, you know, I've, I've also been a bit into meditation and, and these things uh, for the past, I don't know, like year, year and a half. And, you know, like letting it sink in and letting it, you know, you know, living that experience as fully as you can also lets you come out of it because otherwise you'll always have that there, you know, sort of happening but not happening and, and realizing what's going on and like really feeling what you're feeling, I guess, um, is, is, is one of the ways of actually being able to overcome whatever is happening, right? Yeah, exactly. And then that idea that you have agency, I think, you know, there's a lot of layers to this onion, but um, this idea that your mood is going to be your mood, right? And we're, you know, depending on what researcher you believe, about 50% of that is out of our control, right? So ultimately, your biology is going to predisposition you to certain things. And so if the whole time you're reading that, the, you know, that you should be happy or, you know, that <laughs> happiness is an element, you know, we've gone so far that we're treating it like GDP, right, in, in some areas of science, you know, we're looking at whole countries and trying to decide, you know, correlate what they do with this idea. Optimize happiness. for happiness. Correct. <laughs> and at the end of the day, that just might not be available. But the problem is when we do that, when we set that goal, and you had mentioned that, you know, my day job is in fitness, the folly of what we called fitness inspiration, some people called it fit pro, you know, in short, these ideals that you can't live up to, that dissidence that you create in people's mind, when there's no possible way to reach this quote unquote ideal, you're causing harm. And so that's one of the other things that, you know, I wouldn't call myself a crusader, but I feel like I'm writing a wrong is that, you know, it's okay to feel the way you do. At the end of the day, though, we all have agency, right? We have the agency to put 
food in our mouths. We have the agency that no matter if we can't lose weight, we can still be active because we know, at least from current science, that being, you know, even just walking for a certain amount of time is likely going to lead to better outcomes and more longevity and similar to enjoying what you're doing, right? And so the ability to disseminate the fact that you do have some agency that ultimately you don't have to feel happy, but you can go and find joy and delight in things that you're already doing is important because even though it's a you know very rudimentary basic science concept, it's something that's not talked about often um, or often enough. Um, and then when you get down you know a layer deeper, I think because it's a social norm, especially for adults and parents, that this idea that fun is either whimsical or if you prioritize it, then you're not doing justice for the rest of your life. Certainly here in the U.S., we have burnout at you know astronomical rates enough that you know the World Health Organization is now recognizing it you know as a major problem and that's because people aren't doing things out you know for themselves and for others that are bringing them joy and delight they're optimizing for productivity and optimizing you know output for external entities in a way that's just not healthy and so you know we've gotten to a point in our history where we need simple tips so that we can write write this ship <laughs> and 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 how how can we i mean how can we do that it sounds I mean, sometimes when you hear it, it sounds almost obvious for some people, but then when you sit down and get to it, how do you how do you bring fun into the table? Yeah, so I think, you know, the mechanisms there are really easy, right? Like most things, right? So similar to uh, being healthy, right? Like eat right and exercise. Yet, you know, there's so many podcasts and blogs and books about how to eat right and you know, how to exercise, right? Right. So, and I think that's because there's not one single approach for anyone in that avenue. So similar to having fun, there's some basic tenets, but they're not being used enough that it is uh, important for us to disseminate that, right? And one is to look, we have 168 hours in our week, right? And so this is sort of basic tenet of, you know, any productivity exercise, but you can use those same mechanisms of a time audit in your week to look for opportunities where you're not really doing anything and you could either you replace what you're currently doing with an activity that brings you you know more joy and delight or you could increase a particular activity with more joy and delight by redesigning it so example that i often use for the latter is that um, on the weekends i was going to watch my daughter dance she's still young so it's not really competitive dance it's more you know just something to do from an extracurricular um, nature. And I was sitting there on my phone, totally bored, right? And so it dawned on me, you know, we could be having a lot of fun together for just a little bit more money. I likely could get a private instructor that would teach us both the dance so that I could engage with my daughter. She's still getting the same path towards mastery because again, she's at a level where it's pretty rudimentary skill development. And then I can enjoy that experience with dancing with my daughter, which is a very whimsical, fun thing to do. So what was sort of fun for my daughter? Well, you know, I'm putting words in her mouth, but was likely fun <laughs> for my daughter, but not fun for me. Now is fun for both of us. And we're creating memories that we can relish later. So that's an opportunity, you know, where I took one hour in my week um, and optimized it for fun. And then there are things that are talked about quite a bit, which I kind of dance around um, because certainly, you know, elements of watching Netflix with a partner and talking and engaging about something like Game of Thrones, you know, if you're doing it within moderation, is fine. And I'm, I keep preferencing this because when I attack binge watching media without, you know, that preface, people will go, well, what are you trying to say? You know, like that watching TV is evil? Well, no, it's not. But oftentimes, if we look at our behavior, we're using it because we're, you know, to to uh, channel my inner near, um, we're using it to distract, or, <laughs> distract ourselves from something else because it becomes easy. And then that's a downward spiral, right? Where we kind of sink into something that we clinically know, you know, mirrors depression because it's easy to do. And unfortunately, even though there are a lot of great things about the human condition, one of the bad things is that we do tend to gravitate towards homeostasis. So, you know, the body does like you know, in certain instances to sort of so, just so, do so you're actually saying it's our responsibility to make our, our work and our lives more fun. 
To some degree, if you feel like there are problems that you need to mitigate, right? So, so like it's, another... it's not our boss. It's not the system. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's fair. And I think there's a lot of truth in that statement. Actually, I just, uh, you know, for my own work, interviewed an amazing, she's not a researcher and she'll be the first to tell you that, but she's just this amazing personality. Her name's Tanya Katan. And um, we were talking about this because there are some elements that where a boss has an immense amount of responsibility when they're trying to instill fun, right? Because it needs to be co-created and to have true fun, people need to know that there's this degree of safety and they still want their own independence and autonomy to truly have fun, right? When fun is prescribed by your boss, then it can be less fun, right? There was just a great study out of Brown and this is where it gets complex, right? We could have volumes and volumes of this podcast about um, what does fun mean? And, you know, I'd already kind of criticized happiness for being subjective, but to some degree, even though fun is action oriented and a lot easier to quantify, there's is a subjective element to fun, right? And so, sorry, I got off the rails, but back to that, <laughs> that study, it, it indicated that, you know, bosses that are trying to instill fun in the workplace, if they force their colleagues to go have lunch with them, you know, maybe at a fun place or whatever it is, they're actually causing harm because that might not be fun for that particular employee. So even though I know you're being a bit tongue in cheek with that question, there is some truth in it because ultimately you know what fun is for you. So is it your responsibility to, you know, realize that you're eating lunch at your desk, which is a terrible idea because you're not going to only serve your work better by taking a break, but also yourself by having that hour for renewal and having the right mindset about that thing that is supposed to be a break. Yeah, actually it is your responsibility. You know, it is your choice whether or not you want to sit and get some warm, gross meal from your cafeteria, or actually go out and enjoy that hour in a way that's meaningful for you, whether that's connecting with a friend, or if you happen to be an introvert, whether that's getting some sunshine with a good book. Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. Just a quick break before we continue with this episode. If you've been enjoying this podcast, I would really appreciate if you share it with your friends and family, and on social media. On Twitter, and Instagram, it's at Rob Alvarez B and the hashtag Professor Game, all one word. And in Facebook, you can find the Professor Game page. Thanks in advance for your engagement. So, Mike, I wanted to, we've, we've gone down several rabbit holes and I've enjoyed it very much, but I would also like to know a couple of things about you before before we let you go, because the first thing that, that you know, we've been talking about is fun. And when, of course, sort of prescribing fun, is there something that you would say is sort of a best practice? We've kind of gone through that, but if you had to say one thing, of course, no silver bullets. We already mentioned that there's nothing that works for everybody, but is there some sort of, again, heuristic idea, something to think about that you think would always sort of improve our, our capacity to, to, to find fun, again, in life, in the workplace, wherever that is? Yeah, there's a lot of things to unpack there. So I think at the end of the day, you need to understand what is fun for you, right? There's this, if you boil down our emotions to sort of the essence, right? There's this idea of arousal and valence. Um, arousal being, you know, high arousal is that you find enjoyment at a Rage Against the Machine concert, right? Uh, low arousal being like, you know, the most pleasurable thing for you is being on a beanbag chair in the library in a very quiet space reading a book. Right. And then valence is a little bit easier where we're either in a positive valence state or a negative valence state. And that's easy. Right. We're either finding enjoyment or there's something that's you know sort of adding to apathy, worry or despair. Right. And so the idea is to get to a high valence state, which is going to be fairly relatable to almost everyone. But the arousal part is what's different. And so taking a, a you know, an honest look about what it is that sort of brings you delight and fun. And this becomes more important as we age because a lot of us forget it, right? I mean, you know, not, we're just now starting to re-understand the importance of putting some of this back into our life. But if you if it's so far removed, you know, a decade or more, you might not even remember what brings you fun or you might have to relearn it, right? Because what did bring you fun in high school and college isn't necessarily what's gonna bring you fun now. But understanding that so that you can reintegrate it into your life is super important. And then some more tactical ideas 
are um, this one study that I like to sw- cite quite a bit out of UCLA, the uh, researcher's name is Cassie Holmes, is that simple mindset shifts, um, as woo-woo as that sounds, has been proven time and time again to mean, you know, to make huge impacts. So in her particular study, she took a sample group and asked them to simply look at their weekend as an opportunity for renewal by, uh, you know, envisioning it as a vacation rather than just two days off from work. And there were no other instructions, no tools given, simply just go into Saturday and Sunday knowing that this is a vacation and not the weekend, right? And that had a huge impact on the way they viewed it, on the way they, you know, treated their time, on what they did. So it didn't necessarily mean that they were giving up, you know, the opportunity to do things outside of work, you know, that you have to do like mow your lawn or home improvement or things of that nature. Just they had a better attitude, like, yeah, this is my time. Um, And so a whole host of positive effect came from that simple mind shift. Hmm. And along those lines, you know, challenging simple norms. So one that I actually took from another author, Laura Vanderkam, is this idea that you might go out dancing on Saturdays because, you know, you can only have fun on Saturdays as an adult. Like, you know, Monday through Friday, we've been (laughs) ingrained since we were seven, you know, that those are school days or work days. No fun days. Yeah, exactly. Where, you know, the opportunity to um, engage in this is available to you all seven days. And so, you know, another anecdote that I often bring out from my personal life is, you know, my wife and I certainly fell victim to this. We would, uh, we didn't have any capacity within those five days. So what an opportunity lost, right, to do anything together. And again, you know, I, uh, I think this was in our pre-interview, so didn't make the podcast, but we, you know, talked, you and I talked about being at sort of a, you know, a pay grade where we're not going to get first class flights and things of that nature. And that, <laughs> so I'm in the pay grade where I can't afford a full-time nanny, but we just sort of gave it, you know, went that extra step and we're like, okay, so what can we do within our budget? And we realized we have the luxury of being in a college town that we likely could get somebody, you know, that we respected to play that part-time role. So we have someone come in six hours out of the week during the weekdays, um, and we go on a couple dates and do fun stuff during that six hours. The kids love this person. So instead of having to see their parents all the time, you know, have this new fun person to engage with. And my wife and I get to reconnect, you know, through partnership rather than, you know, our roles as parents. And so, yeah, I think I, you know, I gave you three good ones there. Quite a few best practices, fantastic <laughs> best practices, I, mu- I must say. And having, you know, I know you heard a couple of interviews as well, having a vibe of what the whole podcast is about. Is there somebody, of course, aside from your friend, Nir, who's already been around, is there somebody that you would like to listen to in an interview like this one in Professor Game? Yeah, I think so. I wrote down a few just in case, because I do, <laughs> part of fun is novelty and, uh, and scarcity. So I wanted to make sure it's one that uh, hadn't been mentioned before. But I think my favorite book of the year, I forget if it came out this year, I I should know that because I've been recommending it, but uh, is uh, Annie Duke's Thinking and Bets. Has that been? Nope, definitely not. It's an amazing book. And I think you would love it. So I certainly would uh, suggest you put it on your list. But she is a former professional poker player. And so the first half of the book, she makes the argument that life is more like poker than chess. This idea that, you know, where chess always has a right move um, after, you know, as you pass gameplay to the next opponent, life is a lot more like poker where there is a right decision, but oftentimes luck will make that right decision look like the wrong decision. And it's just amazing (laughs) kind of investigation on, you know, how we bias our decisions and how that's interplayed into uh, our day to day lives. So, uh, yes, Annie Duke. Um, I recommend. Fantastic. Fantastic. And of course, you already mentioned her book as well, and that could be your recommendation as a book. But what book would you recommend if you had to recommend a book to the engagers and why? Yeah, so Thinking in Bets is a great one. Another one that I really enjoyed this year was The Alter Ego Effect by Todd Herman. So he talks about creating a alter ego um, in certain fields of play. So for me, where I found value in that book is this idea of creating a persona that's not scared of public speaking so that I can personify, you know, this uh, sort of leveled up version of myself when I go up on stage. 
but his the toolkit that he provides in the book is very practical and would help you know anybody that's sort of facing a quote unquote villain you know within their field of play so i would highly recommend that book as well oh wow and it reminds me so much of a past guest and friend as well andrzej marchewski i don't know if you've heard of him even unicorn and even ninja monkeys like to play is his book he's a fantastic gamification expert and he's talked about because his name is andrzej marchewski which is a polish last name but he's british and his uh, his Twitter and and I'm guessing that as well the Instagram handles and so on is Dave Rage or D uh, D Average however you wanna you wanna read it and it's kind of his alter ego he he tends to be sort of an introvert in many ways and he's a, a fantastic public speaker so he puts on his hat and he's now Dave Rage and he he does a fantastic job so it it fit, fits it sort of blends in perfectly to that that idea as well I might recommend him the book definitely awesome yeah I'm gonna have to check that out. <laughs> And what would you say is, you know, on the same sense of recommendations, what would you say is your favorite game? So past or present? Hmm, that depends on you. Uh, so I'll go past because even though it's got terrible reviews, I'm uh, not the game, but the movie. <laughs> Do you remember the movie, The Game with Michael Douglas? Which John one? Penn? Uh, it was called The Game. The Game. Um, no, it had, I haven't. It had, so it was... I think it's just a fascinating concept. Um, so in short, not to bore your, uh, your, your listenership, <laughs> it basically, uh, Michael Douglas is trying to make a um, change in his life. And so his, uh, I believe it's his son, Sean Penn plays his son, signs him up for this game that basically takes over his life. And uh, so it's augmented reality before augmented reality. And there was a game company that tried to do this in real life. And the game was called Majestic. And it was so awesome because I like I like mysticism. And, uh, you know, I'm not a big sci-fi reader and saying that it's kind of, you know, I think just because I'm so addicted to nonfiction books, I've never, you know, really had time to fit in fictional books. But I do like things that are, you know, that make you think. And so this game Majestic would sort of integrate with your life. And the whole idea was that, you had, you know, it was very X-Files where you had to um, figure out what the government was doing. And there was, you know, elements of aliens and um, you were trying to get to the bottom of this governmental conspiracy. But they would send you emails, send you faxes. Characters from the game would call you on your cell phone. And man, I just I thought it was so great. Uh, and I think the challenge they had, the reason it eventually went under was issues of timeline. So they you know to be able to do it in mass whenever you kind of signed up for the game uh to make it scalable huge the player, huge challenge yeah right and they never got that right and so unfortunately you know big reveals in the game would always be available to players that were kind of two weeks ahead of you and so i was lucky because i was a for you know i had first mover advantage but i could tell like you know if w what kept me engaged was like oh wow this is so cool and it was when you could really game SEO too. So they were creating like fake, fake governmental websites. And, you know, <laughs> so it was really neat because they would blend real press releases, you know, so they would write, write the game against things that were really happening, you know, and kind of adjust the narrative, but then create these false narratives too. So, you know, it was real life intertwined with um, gameplay. It was just so fun, man. <laughs> sounds sounds fabulous. The nearest thing I've I've heard, and it's relatively recent. Well, I've heard about it before, but I was talking to Adrian Hahn. I don't know if you've heard of Zombies Run, the app. Yes, I have. Yeah. Well, he was talking in a conference I was at, and you know, the whole challenge of integrating, you know, their storyline to you know, sort of every day and creating more and more, and you know, the big challenge of having people engaged to something that is generalized so so they have a mass sub subscription model where there's a lot of people there and you have to continue creating content which you know is available for everybody so i kind of relates to what you were saying but of course it's it's it has a lot more on the fictional side and doesn't really integrate into your life in itself and it's already a big challenge so i i can i can see where that uh, difficulty comes from yeah <laughs> And what would you say is your is your superpower when, you know, creating fun or finding fun for other people or, you know, I don't know, researching for fun and, and leisure and these activities for, for general life? What would you say is that sort of sweet spot? What do you do best? Yeah, I think coalescing ideas is certainly as emerge as my superpower. This idea of borrowing from multiple disciplines of science and, uh, you know, especially because the body of research on fun 
um, is developing, you know, pulling ideas that can help folks have more fun from different disciplines has seemed to be, you know, what's levitating me as a thought leader in the space. With regards to games in general, I think I had mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that I've been doing a lot of uh, neuropsychological testing and where uh, I've been off the charts, which I found really interesting, is this idea of uh, evolutionary game skills. And so, uh, you know, working with this particular practitioner, what they'll do, which I guess is meant to see if you get uh, agitated easily, is you'll play these games where they switch the rules on you at variable intervals. Um, and my ability to understand that the rules have been switched has fascinated these researchers because, to be honest, I'm quite <laughs> average in a lot of other areas. So to know that you have one area that you have a superpower, I felt, you know, you're, you're proud, right? Because you don't want to be. <laughs> you, and and uh, well, especially because, yeah, um, it is what it is. But yeah, so I, I found that interesting because I didn't know that about myself, but it makes sense. I'm a part of you know, where I found my sweet spot is the ability to adapt and adjust quickly to, um, you know, things being thrown at me. And so, <laughs> so the, the part of the concept of being average is that most of the people are part of that average. So the chances <laughs> are, well, in most things, at least we will be average and that's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what I meant. I was dancing around that because I certainly do like to be average. I mean, it makes you, <laughs> you know, similar to kind of where I was adding an element of caution at the beginning. You know, I hate to suggest that the way that I um, go about my regular day would be helpful for anyone else. And so <laughs> to your point, being average and looking at it through that lens allows me to be more helpful in a lot of contexts. I actually quite value being average um, for that very reason, you know, because, you know, I'm sure um, you've talked about design thinking and things of that nature before. And to be able to have that type of empathy requires you to also have that available lens within your toolbox, you know, it's often a challenge when you do, you know, that's one of the plights of folks that are overly intelligent. In my work, you know, I've been looking at this idea of wonder and to do that, I've been talking to a lot of magicians. And one thing I find fascinating in those interviews with magicians is they actually hate non-average folks, like folks that are, <laughs> you know, too intelligent because they'll get in their way. You know, yeah. they'll try and you know, reverse engineer the trick and ruin it for everyone. And a lot of times they can't because a master magician, you know, has ways of mitigating people that are like that. But they look at, you know, unaverage people um, in that sense. <laughs> there you as go. not being able to enjoy themselves, right? Because they're always trying to deconstruct the reality. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure having you today in the podcast. I know we had some, you know, technical challenges on my side at the beginning. Somebody started hammering at the hour of our, of our interview, but we were able to manage, I think, the whole interview without much hammering. Hopefully, if there's any, I'll be able to cut it off on my end. But I don't want to let you go before, you know, you tell us where we can find you, where we can find more about your work, any, of course, any plugs besides your book. I don't know if there's a, a page where we can see any updates on your book or something similar. Of course, if you have any final words, and then we'll say it's game over. <laughs> yeah, thanks. You covered it well. If you're interested in the topic of fun, you know, uh, you can find me at my website at michaelrucker.com. Um, I'm on Instagram at the wonder of fun and on Twitter quite a bit under the handle perform better. And uh, yeah, hopefully if you like the idea of fun, my book's coming out next year. Um, it will be called The Fun Habit. And uh, yeah, would love you to read it if it interests you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much once again, Mike. Great to have you. Fantastic. All these ideas and, and all these reflections we got today. However, for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Engagers, it is fantastic to have you around. And you know, I've said it before and I will say it always because this podcast only makes sense with you. So I'd really like to connect with you on Twitter. That way we can communicate, we can exchange ideas, you can let me know, I don't know, if you have any guests in mind, questions, anything that we can help you with. You can find my Twitter account in professorgame.com slash Twitter. I'm always sharing content on gamification and as you know, especially on education and don't click continue just yet. Are you curious? Are you interested in the world of storytelling? Then you definitely have to listen to the next episode. And for that, you'll have to subscribe using your favorite podcast app 
and of course, listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.